Hi, I'm Alex Hoflick. I'm participating in Multiverse Con as one of the editors over at Pseudopod and president of the Atlanta chapter of the Horror Writers Association. Pseudopod has been bringing free weekly short horror fiction to your ears since 2006, but don't let our back catalog of over 725 stories intimidate you. One click from our front page and we've got a guide to help ease in new listeners. Now for my day job, I'm a traffic engineer. The short version is that I work on pavement markings, signs, and traffic signals. My talk today is about the future of traffic systems including connected and autonomous vehicles. Let's start with some basics of traffic signals, which have been around for over a century. The red, yellow, green lights are controlled by field-hardened computers that can stand to be in a metal box in a wide range of temperatures and have reliable uptimes as close to 100% as possible. Most modern traffic signals operate with a computerized set of inputs where every car that pulls up to the intersection is detected. These vehicles are detected in a number of ways. The most common is an inductive loop. If you see thin lines in the pavement at the stop bar at an intersection, this is a slot cut into the road with wire looped in it. And then you run a current through that wire that creates an electromagnetic field. When a big metal thing like a car or a motorcycle drives through, it changes this electromagnetic field. This field change basically flips a switch that tells the master control computer that a vehicle is present and needs to be served. Another method of detection is video cameras. This video camera establishes a baseline background image and then it uses this background to compare pixel changes. So if you've got a bunch of pixels all coming in the same direction and you know as they progress across it knows that okay that's a car that is entered and I need to do the same flip a switch and tell the master control computer that a car is there that needs to be served you could also do the same exercise by pinging a radar these inputs are used to help determine how much green time each movement at an intersection gets then these algorithms are adjusted by time of day and day a week and this is just one intersection. Now, let's string these intersections together along roads and in grids. Then connect the intersection control computers together in a network and have them talk to each other. Then start sending information up and down the network about platoons that are coming and dynamic adjustments that are needed to accommodate what's coming along. This is where we're at right now, technologically. But connected and autonomous vehicles are about to shake things up. America's culture is at a pivot point to undergo fundamental transformation. The major current perception of transportation links self-identity to the car. You have fervent cults that identify Ford versus Dodge. Fringe cults arise that identify with Saturn or Tesla. The etymology of the word automobile is French and literally translates to self-movement. But in the 20th century, the auto in automobile was also to provide the individual autonomy and freedom. With the post-World War II success and rise of the suburbs, cars were an extension of the self, an extension of freedom, and an extension of American values. One of the last major cultural shifts was an expansion of the interstate system. This new network of freeways impacted the interconnection of small towns and the perception of Main Street USA, as well as how road trips and the roadside evolved. Two great examples of fiction that explore this identity change is the story, Yes, We'll Gather at the River, by Ray Bradbury, originally published in 1969, and the Pixar film Cars, which was released in 2006. Once again, connectivity and speed are inspiring a change. Now, the self is pivoting from the individual who is driving the car to the machine itself. The technology is frequently referred to as CAV, or Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. The connected and autonomous functions are related but different development tracks that are advancing simultaneously. Vehicles will have increasingly better con interconnectivity and communications, both between each other and also the infrastructure. This is the connected piece. Vehicles also continue to get better sensor packets and decision-making algorithms and cameras to support lane assistance and braking support. This is the autonomous piece. Communications with other devices and vehicles is connected. Making decisions by itself is autonomous. 
To give you an idea of what we're on the cusp of developing, deploying, and propagating, I'd like to go through a few examples. Let's start with a straightforward connected vehicle application. You've got a construction zone with an arrow board and barrels marking off a lane ahead. In addition to the physical devices, a message can be broadcast in advance to show on a heads-up device or other human-machine interface that supplements that work zone ahead sign. This message can be set up such that it's only broadcast when the lights are flashing and workers are present. This also moves the message to a better location to command the driver's attention. Let's talk about commanding attention for a minute. Humans have only so much focus and tend to provide attention in this order. The road immediately ahead. The dashboard. The road farther ahead, including overhead signs and signals. Finally, the shoulders. This work zone connected vehicle message moves the critical message from the shoulder to the interior of the car. How about another big safety like hard braking maneuvers that combines connected and autonomous features? Connected cars driving along will all be broadcasting their basic safety message. This shares their position, speed, and direction. Up ahead, a driver makes a hard braking maneuver. It can broadcast that hard braking has occurred and every vehicle behind can receive that information. One of the components of every traffic formula is the human perception reaction time. So this formula, this is a value assigned to the amount of time it takes to receive the information, such as brake lights blazing up ahead, identifying that a reaction is needed, and then moving the foot over to the brake to start to slow down. In a fraction of the time it takes for us to process this, connected and autonomous vehicles can receive and respond to this information. Consider the hard braking maneuver four vehicles ahead of you and each driver in the chain adding their perception reaction time, and you've got 8 to 10 seconds of computing time to help you avoid an insurance seminar from a multi-vehicle pileup. One last cool example. Another connected vehicle application is the signal phasing and timing, or SPAT message. As of today, we have several hundred signals in Georgia that broadcast these messages. By this time next year, we should be well over a thousand. This message says what's green and what's red and how long we have until the lights change. So how do we enhance this? Railroad crossings currently have crossbars and flashing lights to let people know not to cross the tracks due to an oncoming train. With the SPAT message, we can also broadcast that the railroad is in preemption, that it has preempted the signal. Then, as we collect frequency, duration, and times a day, we can start to identify trends. We will be able to broadcast a message that says, a train's coming through, and at this time of day, you can expect a delay of three to five minutes. Drivers tend to make erratic and risky maneuvers when they are delayed and frustrated and don't know how long they're gonna be stuck. If you're only gonna be waiting three minutes, that's way less time than going around another route. If it's a 10 minute delay, maybe that side trip starts to make sense. But if you have information, you can make a decision that works best for you and your trip. Now, start imagining what you can do with other vehicles like electric bikes and scooters talking to cars and signals. Think about transit and school buses broadcasting messages about pedestrians crossing the road. And think about the massive volume of data that is about to be created and the processes that need to be set up at the edge where the action is happening rather than needing to take it back to a central server for processing. I'm looking forward to what this next wave of change brings. This next generation has always had ready computing power and is ready to step up and transform transportation technology. This next generation will be there when we need to seamlessly blend civil engineering with computer hardware and software. I think one way that we can make sure that this next generation arrives and helps out is through fiction and have the artist and visionary inspire the future generations. I don't need to point to all the things in Star Trek that inspired the generations that followed them to make those a reality. Automated doors, the iPad, the flip phone, the tricorder, and on and on. The last future transportation idea that captured imaginations was the flying car. Transportation doesn't have this artistic vision right now, but we could help change that. So we've talked about how the technology works now and how we're approaching the next phase of evolution. Let's discuss some of those sociological applications and impacts. 
One of the major challenges of the transportation industry is an aging population. A lot of recent research has gone into signs to improve the legibility of fonts at greater distances. The retro reflectivity of signs continues to improve as we build better encapsulated prisms in the sheeting and those send more light back to the eyes of drivers from longer distances and less favorable angles. All of these are to accommodate failing eyesight and slower reactions. Many people of my generation are having to grapple with the issue of if and when we have to step in and take the car keys away from our parents. Compound this difficulty with the car being an extension of the self for the older generations. Taking away a parent's keys is an attack on their identity and autonomy and self-worth. May we be the last generation that has to grapple with this. When we have autonomous vehicles, our parents will no longer have to worry about whether they can see the upcoming street name sign or whether they'll be able to brake in time. At the press of a button, they'll be able to summon a vehicle to whisk them away to their quilt guild or canasta game or run their daily errands to the store in the library. Autonomous cars will allow our elders to retain their autonomy and by extension, more of their self-worth. Similarly, the coming-of-age ritual that is getting a learner's permit and driver's license will fade into obscurity. This is already becoming thin as the next generations are far more comfortable with a model of transportation as a service instead of taking on the burden of car ownership. So, what impact will autonomous vehicles have on our land development patterns? Look at our current modern urban and suburban landscapes. Our urban cores are filled with parking decks. Our suburban commercial areas have massive asphalt fields to provide the convenience of free parking close to the entrance. In the future, after we're dropped off at the front door of the store, the car is no longer required to sit idle waiting for you to get your loaf of bread, your container of milk, and your stick of butter. It can pick up someone else who's just finished their shopping trip and drop them off at home. Then it could pick up the neighbor three doors down and drop them off at the hair salon before swinging back to meet you out at the front after you finish checking out. The shared service is vastly more desirable than an empty zombie car endlessly circling the block in a digital version of twiddling its thumbs while you shop. What happens to all that real estate devoted to the temporary holding of cars? How is land use and development going to shift? NACTO is the National Association of City Transportation Officials, and they've got a blueprint for autonomous urbanism, and that's one vision for how this can happen. They see a world where pedestrians and cyclists are detected rather than connected, and autonomous vehicles bring the travel speeds on all urban roads down. Because redevelopment and construction is a large number of small incremental changes over a long time, steps need to be taken now to prepare for an autonomous future. Ignore the naysayers, these optimistic planners say. Autonomous vehicles don't have to destroy the American city. They're a shiny opportunity to rebuild it for the better. So what is the new evolution of the one stoplight town? What will be the new status symbol of progress? What happens to the last one light town after the final non-autonomous vehicle is removed from the fleet? I would love to see the visions from the dreamers and the artists to answer all of these questions and more. We got plenty of examples of what can go wrong with this technology. Last year, as episode 659 of Pseudopod, we shared the 1901 story Lord Beaton's Motor by J.B. Harris Burland, which explored the fears of the introduction of the automobile to the transportation network. Earlier this year, as episode 688 of Pseudopod, we shared the 1961 story The Tunnel Ahead by Alice Glazer, which explores some of the pros and cons of autonomous vehicles and we've got 2020 examples of scooters turned off centrally during city curfews, trapping pedestrians trying to get back inside. Cory Doctorow's latest book in the Little Brother series explores autonomous vehicles used badly. But our future doesn't have to be dystopias of bodies littered along the roadside by malicious vehicles or cold eugenics or other dystopian nightmares. We have the opportunity to shape our vision of the future as a hopeful one where we use technology to make our lives better. I look forward to the fiction that inspires us to reach for the future and show the best of what humanity can achieve. 
Hi, I'm Emily Leverett, and thanks for joining me today. I'm going to be talking about the ways that Terry Pratchett and the Las Vegas Golden Knights hockey team both use medieval romance tropes and story to create identity. I'll be talking about Terry Pratchett's phrase narrative causality, as well as medievalism and the literary critic Helen Cooper's term memes. So first, we're starting with storytelling and identity. Stories are powerful. That's how people like us end up in places like this, because they're powerful things because we love stories so much we can't help but want to talk about them. We want to read them. Lots of us want to write them. More than anything, we want to be part of them. We just don't use stories only to entertain us. There are role models. Stories tell us who we are. But sometimes stories are too powerful. Sometimes we force ourselves to conform to stories' rules. Terry Pratchett noted that sometimes we let stories govern who we are. That's what he calls narrative causality. The idea that there are story shapes into which human history, both large scale and at the personal level, attempts to fit. It's probably more simple to, sensible to say that we ourselves have the story shapes in our mind and attempt to fit facts of history into them. All right, so today's structure, I'm gonna talk about medievalism, medieval romance and memes, and give some definitions and things like that. Then I'm gonna talk about Terry Pratchett's reluctant hero, Samuel Vimes in Guards Guards. And finally, I'm gonna talk about the 2018 Las Vegas Golden Knights Stanley Cup final pregame show. So to start out, medievalism. Medievalism is the appearance of anything medieval in a post-medieval time period. So lots of comic books use medieval story arcs, and then there's the usual suspects like The Lord of the Rings, Dungeons and Dragons, Game of Thrones, Robin Hood, Assassin's Creed Vikings. Medieval romance is something different. It probably conjures thick paperback books with half-naked men and women on them. And indeed, that is probably the great-grandchild of medieval romance. But medieval romance is written in the Middle Ages, and it's about knights, quests, ladies, magic crusades, monsters, and Arthurian legend. Pretty much anything related to Arthur you've heard comes from medieval romance. Now, Nicola MacDonald says, more than any other medieval genre, the Middle English romances are exemplary of what American narratology, of what modern narratologists call narrative desire. The kind of desire that propels popular romance always finds satisfaction. So what she means by this is that there's always closure. No matter what weirdness happens in the middle, the stories have a beginning and a definitive end. And in an era where everything is uncertain, which is what the Middle Ages was, and frankly, is what to now, what now is too, these stories can be really, really comforting. Now, when I talk about memes, I don't mean the internet memes today, although they are related. Helen Cooper used this, the term to describe essentially medieval tropes. She says, a meme is a unit within literature that proves so useful, so infectious, that it begins to take on a life of its own. A meme is an idea that behaves like a gene in its ability to replicate faithfully and abundantly, but also on occasion to adapt, mutate, and therefore survive in different forms and cultures. And so that's sort of the thing that keeps repeating and reappearing over and over and over and over again. So Helen Cooper identifies lots of memes, but the two that matter to me today are the quest and the lost heir. The quest is obvious. A person is called in to fix some problem and it requires some kind of travel. When they're done, they return as a hero. As for the lost heir, sort of the basic idea and what Pratchett uses is that an heir lives their life in secret and in returns to their home when a crisis makes the return necessary. In Guards Guards, this is the appearance of a dragon. Now I know if you've read Discworld, you know that Carrot Iron Founderson is the lost king of Ankh Morpork. However, Vime fits the lost heir, the last heir, lost heir narrative too, even though he's born and raised in Ankh Morpork. So when we start the novel, Vimes is caught between rejecting the city and knowing that he can't reject it. He calls Aunt Morpork both it and her. He calls it both lady and bitch, but acknowledges that it's all he has, that she opened her great booming rotten heart to him, and it's all he has, even when he's in the gutters. He's born in the city, but he's completely alienated from it, and like the last, the lost heir who can't return, he can't really quit it either. So what's the thing that starts to bring him back to Ankh Morpork? A dragon attacks it. Um, so this dragon attacks and 
then vanishes so no one knows it was a dragon. And it is at this point that Vimes decides that he needs to take it seriously to actually follow and investigate the crime that's going on. And he starts to be more attached to the city. He says, no bloody flying newt sets fire to my city. Listen, if anyone ever sets fire to this city, it's going to be me. So it's humorous, but it is him sort of reaching a point of deciding that the city needs saving and he in fact is going to do it. Um, I should also note in this moment, we see the sort of classic detective sort of um, trope going on as well. And in fact, he is loosely based on Dirty Harry. And at one point, Vimes does ask a mob if they feel lucky. So even though Vimes does heroic things like save Sybil Ramkin from a dragon, he's not a traditional hero. And he is very, very clear on that. In fact, he knows the traditional hero stories and he does not like them. So he says, the hero always cuts it fine, but he always gets there just in the nick of time. Only the nick of time was probably five minutes ago, and I'm not a hero. I'm out of condition, and I need a drink, and I get a handful of dollars a month without plumes allowance. That's not a hero's pay. Heroes get kingdoms and princesses, and they take regular exercise, and when they smile, the light glints off their teeth. Ting! The bastards. So he refuses to sort of let his actions and ideas be governed by the idea of traditional hero. Nonetheless, he still saves Sybil and is a hero. So what's the takeaway? Well, Pratchett uses both epic fantasy and medieval romance tropes to explore how humanity's stories form notions of the self. Vimes is not a hero because he rejects the stories. He's a hero because he chooses when and how stories affect his identity. Pratchett, a creator of stories, reminds us that the most important story is the one that we tell ourselves. So now we're going to return, or now we're going to turn to hockey. So we're moving from a character who refuses to let stories dictate his reality to the Las Vegas Golden Knights, who seem to want to give the opposite a go. They use the classic quest, a narrative of a fight against horrible odds, as a means of motivating themselves and their fans. They want to write the story before it happens of them being the plucky underdog who, against all odds, wins the championship. I return now to the, mo to the idea of desire. Romances fulfill desire because regardless of how it turns out, there's a coherent end. It might not be the end we want, Arthuriana classically is a tragic story, but it comes to a conclusion. Sports are the same, right? There is a playoff series, that series ends, period. Whether you're happy with the ending or not, who knows? But the suspense is eventually satisfied. So the Golden Knights use their pregame show to tell their own story. So the 2018 Stanley Cup final, forging an identity through medieval spectacle. A little bit about hockey. There are 31, now 32 teams. Their season is 82 games long from October to April. And then there are four rounds of playoffs that happen between April and June. Each round of playoffs is a best of seven series. So you have to win at least, or you have to win 16 games to win the cup. And you could play as many as 28, though no one has ever played that much in one. Um, so the Vegas Golden Knights were an expansion team. This is their first year in the league. So league narrative, hockey narrative says they should be terrible for at least three to five years. They weren't, they were amazing. And a lot about them was unique, including their pregame show. It's not the traditional pregame show. Colin Dwyer and Becky Sullivan of NPR tell us what the traditional pregame show is. If you watch virtually any team but the Vegas Golden Knights, you'll find the performance before the game pretty straightforward. There's the highlight reel on the Jumbotron, Jumbotron above center ice, the overloud pump up song, the dimmed lights, yada, 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 then Bam! The home team takes the ice as the fans above the rink erupt in ear-splitting cheers. So that's what it's like. The pregame show is for the people in the arena, not for people watching on TV, and they very rarely, if ever, televise it. But Vegas is different. It's not the traditional pregame show. First, they start with a recap on the Jumbotron that explains that they have defeated the Los Angeles Kings, that they have feasted on the San Jose Sharks, which is in the bottom right, and that they have grounded the Jets from Winnipeg in order to get to the Stanley Cup final. So now 
at the Stanley Cup final and the first two games are in Vegas, they have a new enemy, the Washington Capitals, and the Capitals are in the building. So a handful of minion knights come out and the leader of the Capitals descends from the ceiling of the arena on a wire, lands, and then takes on the Golden Knight. It's interesting to note that the Washington Capitals have their own underdog story. The previous year, they were the best team in the league and everyone was all about, oh, this is the Capitals year. And they went out fairly early in the playoffs. So they have their own underdog narrative going on across the country in DC. But sure enough, they fight. And this is going clockwise. They fight, the Golden Knight disarms the Capitol and then he drives his sword into the ice causing it and this is the bottom left to shatter and this the entire arena goes dark so you see this crackling imagery in light across the ice um then we get a glimpse at the teams they themselves are going to come out now the goalies lead their teams out descending again from the roof is a gigantic knight's helmet through which the team comes out the Vegas Knights come out, the Capitals come out a little door on the side. But goalies always lead their teams out, whether it's preseason or not. Um, and it's great that they also are the ones that look the most like medieval knights, right? Like they're the ones that are in the most armor because they've got to defend against a small piece of rubber going somewhere between 60 and 110 miles an hour at their face. So they're you know, big pads, they've got the great big stick that looks like a broadsword, and of course the cage that looks like a knight helmet. Um, so it works out pretty well. But the other thing that hockey has in common with romance is transgression. So in romance, transgression is half the fun. That is all the weirdness in the middle. So Again, McDonald says, popular Middle English romance locates itself precisely at the juncture between conformity and rebellion, between the kind of narrative order that finds resolution in the inviolable happy ending and the chaos that is threatened by the giants and rapists, incubi, cannibals, and necrophiliacs, to say nothing of the abusive parents and their wild offspring who roam the romance landscape. Narrative pleasure is produced by and in the gap that exists between the conventions that structure romance and the transgression that its narrative produces. So totally wackadoo stuff happens in the middle of romance. Hockey itself actually is notorious for its weirdness. There are unusual bounces in the playoffs, normally completely rational and composed players suddenly will punch each other in the face, pucks ring off, um, the pipes it's impossible sort of to predict what's going on in fact there's a youtube channel called weird nhl and during the season it comes out about once a week because there's that much odd stuff that happens so it's perfect sort of to align with romance it's got all of this weird stuff in the middle but there's always also going to be a coherent end and when it comes to the pregame show, Johnny Greco, who is the vice president of entertainment and production, had a really clear idea of how to work it. And it's because he spent five years working in the WWE. And if there is anything that's sort of more theatrical than the Las Vegas opening performance, it would be the WWE. And so he says, the WWE opened my mind to storytelling. They simplified the stories. It's good versus evil. We have a bad guy come out and then we have the good guy come out. It's storytelling 101 and you don't have to complicate it to make people care about it. The fans already care about the team, right? The local fans do. This kind of performance got Vegas fans sort of all across the country. So the good guy comes out, he beats up the bad guys, they win. But it's not always easy, right? The fight doesn't always go the way the good guys want it to go. Um, the way that the playoffs work, there were two games in Las Vegas, and Las Vegas won one of them. Then they went to DC to play two games in DC, and DC won both of those. Now they're back in Las Vegas for game five, and Vegas is down 3-1. So if they lose this game, the playoffs are over and the Capitals win the Stanley Cup. So this is a must win situation. But now the narrative before game five changes rather than it being easy to beat the Capitals. It's much, much more difficult. Now, in this case, the Capitals cheat. The head 
of the Capitol sneaks up behind the knight while he is fighting off the minions and whacks him in the back of the neck and he tumbles. So sometimes the heroes stumble, sometimes they fail a little bit and he gets his helmet knocked off as they fight. They're beat down, but not broken. And then the knight calls to the allies, just like he does at the beginning in game one, um, and they come to his assistance. There is a castle front facade at the end, one end of the arena, and you can see in the bottom left picture, there's a Robin Hood figure in archers that will come to the aid of um, the knight on the ice. And then on the other side of the arena, at the other end, is a trebuchet, which is a machine whose job is to fling rocks over walls, right? Like a catapult. So they launch the trebuchet. And this of course is the bottom right picture. And the evil capital leader is, you know, sort of crushed as the ice shatters beneath him. So it's really great special effects in terms of not actually launching a massive rock <laughs> at, um, you know, not deep, but definitely still brittle ice. And so then the pregame show ends with the knight saluting the audience, saluting all the fans there. The narrator, um, a woman with a fabulous voice, explains right before he calls for help that everyone there, everyone there are knights tonight and everybody cheers. And so it's very much a sort of team effort right and that team includes the fans so he gives credit to the fans essentially sort of bringing them into the fellowship of knights that exist so the pregame narrative sets up the would-be story of the las vegas golden knights dream first season bruised and a bit beaten down they get up they pull together and they triumph it's the ultimate sports story right it perfect movie so did it work no, it did not. The Capitals won the game. The Capitals won the cup in a city that is excellent to celebrate in. Um, and this is a shot of sort of knights in action. Braden Holby, the um, Capitals goalie, has made an amazing save. You can just see the puck underneath his glove and his stick. Um, the knight had a basically open net and he Holby had to fling himself back across and make an amazing save that both inspired his team and really just sort of sucked the air out of the arena for the Knights. Um, it wasn't the game ending thing, but it was one of the things that, con that contributed to it. So the Capitals got their underdog triumphs narrative. Um, now Vegas made it back to the playoffs the next year, but didn't make it to the final. They made it back to the playoffs this year, which was delayed for a while when the season was paused because of um, all of the stuff that has been going on. Um, and they made it to the Western Conference final uh, where they lost to Dallas. And just a couple nights ago, before I recorded this, Dallas lost to the Eastern Championships, the Tampa Bay Lightning, who had a redemption story very similar to that of the Capitals. Last year, they were the number one team. They scored, um, they amassed as many points as any team ever had in a season. Um, so they, they tied that record. So they blew everybody else out of the water. They were like already crowned when they were walking into the playoffs and they lost the four, the first round in a sweep. They lost four games straight to the lowest seeded team, um, that they faced, which happened to be the Columbus Blue Jackets. Interesting, weird thing about that season, all four of the lowest seeded teams beat all four of the highest seeded teams in that first round. Never happened before. Totally weird. But again, hockey is weird. So what's the point of all of this? And here is the Capitals with their knight and leader, um, Alexander Ovechkin in the middle of the one with the beard and the missing teeth. They all have beards because beards are a hockey playoff thing. Um, but you can see all of them and it's a cup, right? It's sort of a medieval looking thing itself. So what's the point of it? Well, I hope what I've shown today is the power of stories to shape our own lives and experiences. Medieval stories are so ubiquitous that they don't need explanation. Even if you've got no idea who Samuel Vimes is, or you've never watched a day of hockey in your life, you get it. Um, both of these groups, both Terry Pratchett and the Las Vegas Golden Knights are using stories to, to create identity and to have conversations about what makes identity. So 
The dangerous thing then is taking these stories as already written, as irresistible facts of life. Writing ourselves a championship narrative doesn't automatically make us champions and trying to smoosh our lives into a story we think we should be living doesn't necessarily make us happy. Stories are powerful and they can guide us and inspire us and give us frameworks to think about our own identities, but we have to be the ones that create our own stories. We have to write our lives ourselves. So thanks very much for watching. There are a lot of ways to find me. You can follow me on Twitter um, at Emily Leverett. Follow me on Instagram at Emily Leverett Author, which is mostly cat pictures. Follow me on Facebook, Emily Lavin Leverett. Um, check out my webpage, emilylavinleverett.com. If you join my newsletter, you get a free story. Um, you can also email me at emily.lavin.leverett at gmail.com. You can find my books on Amazon and other booksellers or at Falstaff Books. Let me be really clear. <laughs> I love talking about this stuff. So feel free to drop me a line. I love talking about hockey. I love talking about Terry Pratchett, which is what I do a lot of my scholarship on. I love talking about medieval romance, which is I've also done scholarship on. And I've also written romance with the sort of medievalism point of view. So I really am happy to talk about any or all of those things. I find these sort of things super, super exciting to talk about. So Thank you again very much for spending time with me today, um, and I'd love to hear from you.